God's word can be read and he can speak to you and meet you in that, okay? So, Revelation 7, we're going to read through this together. If you are there, say, let's do this. Revelation chapter 7. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, that no wind might blow on earth or sea or against any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun with the seal of the living God. And he called with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm earth and sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of the sealed, 144,000, sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. 12,000 from the tribe of Judah were sealed, 12,000 from the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 from the tribe of Gad, 12,000 from the tribe of Asher, 12,000 from the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000 from the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000 from the tribe of Simeon, 12,000 from the tribe of Levi, 12,000 from the tribe of Asakar, 12,000 from the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000 from the tribe of Joseph, 12,000 from the tribe of Benjamin were sealed. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are those clothed in white robes, and where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away their tears from their eyes. Thank you. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. It is good to hear it. In a world where we hear so many messages, so many things throughout the week, pounding through our headphones or coming through the media and the television, it's good to hear your word and the truth of what we have in you, the truth of who you are, the the promise of eternity that feeds our soul and the reminder of your presence now with us. God, thank you for this word. May it help us understand our reality, that our reality is not just what we see in front of us. There is a greater reality at play. So increase our faith, Lord, to trust you, In these moments, no matter where we come from or what we've been battling this week, we're before you and we ask you to speak to our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, today we continue through this journey of Revelation. Revelation chapter 7. And those of you that like symbols and images and pictures and abstract ideas, this is for you, right? And some of you really love Revelation because that's how you talk. You, you, you have a thought, and you're like, well, let me try to figure out how to say what that is. And so you start using pictures to describe your feelings and emotions and what's going on and what it was like. And sometimes people aren't quite sure exactly where you're going or where you're going to land. And you're like, just hang with me. And you keep going until you finally get there, right? Nothing linear about it. Others of us, we like linear to the point. This, 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 clear, bullet point, next. We got work to do. Let's move on. Well, sorry, linear folks. Uh, The book of Revelation, uh, God did not consult you on how he should write it, so it's not a linear book. Rather, it's using pictures and symbols and imagery and numbers and all of these things to mean different things, to describe reality to us. In fact, the only thing that's really linear in the book is the order in which John sees things in his vision. 
I saw this, and then I saw this, and then I saw this. But that's not describing the order in which those events will happen. He's just giving you the order in which he saw things. In fact, as we come to chapter 7, what we have here is a flashback, like in a movie. You ever been watching a movie, and you're trying to go, like, wait, what is happening here? And you're trying to put the pieces together. I'm a huge Jason Bourne fan. Love the Jason Bourne movies. Like, anytime they're on, it's like, okay, no work's getting done. I have to watch this. And if, oh, all three of them are on TNT. Okay, looks like I know what I'm doing for the next 12 hours of my life, right? Like, I have to watch it. But it's this movie, this guy, right, he's trying to, he's living his life, but he's got amnesia, so he's trying to figure out who he is. And so you're tracking through his story, and you, he's coming to these dramatic points, and you're like, what is going on? And then, boom, flashback. And you're like, Oh, and it starts to fill in the gaps so you can understand so the drama that's happening here can come into clarity and be answered. Well, that's what chapter 7 of Revelation is because this is a very dramatic book. Those of you that don't like drama, this is also not for you because Revelation is filled with drama. And there was this drama that was building and building and building and then Revelation 7 will be a flashback to help us. So we saw this beginning in chapter 4, right? There's all this pain and chaos going on on earth in first century as li- Christians are living under the oppression of the Roman Empire. And yet John gets this vision. Now he sees the throne in heaven and God is reigning from the throne. And there's worship and praise. And so chapter 4, all of heaven is worshiping God right now for who he is. And we are invited to join him in that worship. Then you get to chapter 5, and he sees, wait a minute, the one on the throne, there's a scroll in his hand. And that scroll we talked about is God's plan of redemption and judgment on the earth that's going to be unleashed. And it's a sealed scroll, and John is now like, oh no, who is worthy to open that scroll? Who's going to carry out the plan and bring that about and finally and fully crush evil? No one was worthy, and John is weeping. Weeping. Who's worthy? And then someone says, no, weep no more. There is one. It's Jesus. It's the lamb who had lived and died and he had resurrected and he's alive again. He's conquered death. He's conquered sin. He's conquered the grave. And so he is the one who is worthy. And so there's worship that happens of this resurrected, risen lamb who has conquered all of this. And so we see this worship of the lamb not only for who he is, but now for what he's done. And so then chapter 6 comes, and he's going to start to undo the seals to open the scroll. And what we see happening in chapter 6 is now he's going to be unleashing these judgments upon the earth. And these seals deal with not something just in the distant future, but it's talking about the way that God has enacted judgment from the first century through every century, including our century, all the way up until the end when the final peace is when Jesus Christ will return on the earth. And so here he is, and he's opening these seals. And we see this drama as this is happening. And the first four was represented with these horses. Now, we think horses like, oh, you want to go ride horses? Cute. Let's do that. Let's go on a horseback riding adventure, right? Maybe it's a good thing for Valentine's Day, guys. And so, but they would hear horses and think battle. Horses represented fighting, battle, military. And so here we have this image of God now sending judgment on the earth through these imagery of horses, which represent a variety of different things, including that wars and military wars. You have evil forces upon the earth. You have all kinds of pestilence and disease. You have death. And you've got the fifth seal being opened, which is the people who have died for their faith in heaven going, how long, O Lord, bring this to an end, fully and finally judge everything and purge the earth of all of this so that everything can be right with God and us forever, heaven and earth united. How long, O Lord? How long, O Lord? And then you have this sixth seal being opened, which was describing God's unleashing of this cosmic judgment on the earth and it talks about creation it talks about everything just being ravaged and you have this scene of people everybody and their little dog hiding in caves from the face of God when God's full wrath and judgment will be revealed 
And it left us with the question at the end of chapter 6, who can stand? There's your cliffhanger. There's your drama. There is the question, who can stand when God pours out his full judgment on the earth? The God who sees everything. The God who is going to wipe out all of evil. Who can stand in that? Roll credits, cliffhanger. Kind of like the end of Avengers, Infinity War. Sorry to spoil it for you, right? But you got the snap. Spider-Man. Roll credits. See you next year. So here we are at the end of chapter 6. Who can stand? Chapter 7. Flashback. Let me tell you something that has taken place prior to this point of this final judgment beginning to happen. Let me tell you. Flashback. Because when nobody was worthy to open the scroll, the good news is there will be people who can stand. And so that's what's going on in chapter 7. Verse 1 brings us to this flashback. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, that no wind might blow on the earth or sea or against any tree. Remember the number four. They've got numbers throughout this. We've got twelves. We've got twelves of twelves. We've got fours. We've got sevens. We've got all kinds of things going on. We've got thousands, like four, to the totality of the earth here. And so... Um, and at the end of 6, there was this great cosmic pain on the earth. And here we now see flashing back. Before that happens, angels are holding back before all that begins to happen. This is the flashback right here. So before that happens, something is happening. There's a holding back before God sends all of this. Who can stand? Who's going to make it through this judgment? Everybody's going to be toast. Nobody's going to make it. No, wait. Here comes something. Verse 14 even alludes to it as calling it the great tribulation. Now, when we hear term great tribulation, if you've been in uh, most American churches, we think of that as some period in the distant future that one day, um, or maybe you've heard that you'll be raptured out of here and you won't have to worry about it because other people will go through it. But the great tribulation and tribulation is constant. It is our world. It is our reality. It has been since then, and it will be to the end. Some of you are like, it doesn't feel like it. Look over the whole earth. The horsemen are out. There is satanic forces. There is military wars and battles and evils. There is all kinds of suffering and pain and pestilence and disease. And there is death everywhere. In fact, Jesus said it like this in John 16. In the world, you will have tribulation. That's what you have in this world. Why is your life hard? Because it's tribulation. That's what we have. But take courage, Jesus says, I have overcome the world. Why does this break again? Why is this sick again? Why are we here again? Why does this keep happening? Because in this world, this is what you have. It is a life of tribulation, death, disease, war, strife, pain, murders, abortion. Martyrs, people moving to places to say, here's the good news of the gospel, and they throw a spear and kill him. His missionaries have died in different places for bringing the gospel. There's tribulation until the final return of Christ, and we will see this return, and there you see it in 6 and 7, as this cosmic wrath will not be limited, and who will be able to stand? Verse 2. Then I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun with the seal of the living God. And he called with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm earth and sea, saying, do not harm the earth, the sea, the trees, until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. Now notice who is harming the earth. Did you catch that? The angels sent by God. God is bringing the harm. This is consistent, okay, with Scripture. Some of you are like, I don't like the thought of that being God. That's who God reveals himself as, a God who judges, a God who has wrath. In fact, you go back to the Old Testament. In the book of Genesis, God has made everyone in his image. 
And we get a few chapters in, and he's already regretting making mankind. And it says because he looked and saw that the thoughts and attitudes and intentions of the heart were only evil all the time. And his heart was broken. He regretted it. Evil only, meaning what? Meaning that instead of surrendering and trusting and submitting and saying, God, I want what you want and you rule and everything that you do is for your glory and my good and it's going to cause everything to prosper and flourish and thrive. I trust you, I follow you, I submit to you, I love you and you love me. Instead, it's like, no, you know what? Forget that. I do my thing. I do my way. I do what I see as best. That's the essence of sin and rebellion. And God saw that was the condition of mankind. And so what does he do? He sends a flood of judgment. Rain and rain and rain and rain and rain. Noah, the ark. Isn't it odd that we put cute Noah with his little family and the little animals in children's nurseries on the wall or hanging above, you know, their their crib? Like, oh, this beautiful scene with this cute family and these cute animals. Wait a minute, what about all the fact that all these people died in a flood? Like, next time you paint that up there, maybe paint a few dead bodies floating in the water. Your kid will love it, trust me. What is that? Reality. Judgment. If you get out of this crib, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> Joke. Right, but it, it's, a, it's a sea of judgment. It was a flood of judgment that God poured out his wrath through this flood, and it wiped everybody out except Noah and his family. Well, that's the way we think about this. They were sealed up in the ark, right? They were spared from the judgment that was pouring out as they were protected by God in this ark from the wrath of God. Same logic happening here in Revelation. That this ceiling that is his protection and provision. Which so we need to understand this and hold on to this promise is this. That God alone provides protection for his people when he sends his judgments on the earth. That when God sends these into the world on the earth and he is judging. He alone provides protection for his people. Now Noah experienced physical protection didn't he? Could you imagine being in that ark? The stink, the terror, and the horror as everything that you know is just being flooded. People that refused to believe are flooded in this. And yet Noah was spared physically while the rest were not. And here's the deal. Sometimes God does that. Sometimes he protects you physically but not always. Not always. In fact, what we see in Revelation is people that were not spared physically. They were killed for their faith. They were martyrs. There would be more martyrs to come. Sometimes God spares us physically. Some of us have been miraculously spared in different things. Hurricanes. Sometimes we are physically spared. Noah was spared physically, but it was ultimately because there was a spiritual protection that had to happen for people like you and me see if god wipes out noah and his whole family you got nobody he could just start over because he's god right but he can't because in genesis chapter 3 verse 15 what happened was adam and eve sinned and god made a promise and god said from adam and eve from your seed will come one who will crush the head of the serpent who has caused all of this this evil Well, he's going to come. He's going to come from Adam and Eve, and he's going to rise up, and he will crush and put an end to evil ultimately, pointing to Jesus. And so here, when God looks on the earth and sees everybody wicked, he could wipe everybody out and start all over again, but he can't because he made the promise. And so he says, I'm going to spare this family because it's through their line, through Noah and his family, who ties back to Adam and Eve all the way down, which is ultimately going to lead to Jesus, who is going to be the one who is going to take the wrath and judgment of God for us in our place so that we can be spiritually saved forever and have the hope of resurrection, everything. So God was faithful to that word, so he protected them physically, and it tied into the whole spiritual story of what God's doing in all of redemptive history. But God does not always spare us physically, but he does always protect us spiritually, and that is what the seal is about. 
that God protects your soul. He protects you. Verse 3, do not harm, don't send harm until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. Now this seal on the foreheads would remind people familiar with the scripture in the Old Testament about how God told them to write his law on their foreheads. Now did he literally mean write it on their foreheads? No. The forehead is what you believe, it's what you think about, it's what you trust in, it's where your allegiance is. That's what this is symbolic of. The seal would also remind people of old, uh, in the Old Testament, Ezekiel, where God would send judgment on a city, but before he would send the judgment on the city, he said we have to have our people who are marked on their foreheads. They are to be spared. And it describes the people who are marked on their foreheads, those who are sealed, as ones who hated evil. They hated it. They hated the sins that were committed. They hated the rebellion. They hated the wickedness. They believed all of that was rebellion and wickedness towards God. They were the ones who were sealed and marked. And then God judges the rest. The forehead symbolizes, not literally, but it symbolizes your beliefs, your allegiance. This will be later mocked in the book of Revelation with things like the mark of the beast. And so we've heard things about this, right? And it's like it'll be on their head and on their hands. And so we think head. And so then there's all these conspiracies. What is it, right? It used to be a barcode when I was in college. Like they were going to put a barcode physically on your head. And then it became a microchip they're going to put in your head. And they're going to put a microchip in your hand. And it's like, no. What the enemy does is he mocks the things of God. God marks his people on their head. And it talks about here being marked with his name, the name of God written on their forehead. That also wouldn't be literal. That is telling us what we believe, think, trust in. So those who trust in the beast, those who put their allegiance to and believe in, they serve him with their hands and they think and trust in him with their mind. Or you do that with the Lord, with the Lamb. So that's where that's going. So here God's people are sealed on their foreheads. Your beliefs seal you. We believe in the Lord. We are marked by him. What do you believe in? What do you trust in? Now, it's interesting. A lot of things you got to stay with me through this. This this book is really thick. But in Matthew 16, there's this incredible scene. Do you know that even your belief in God and in Christ is because God has done that to you? See, some of you live as though everything depends on you. Me, me, and my thing. i got to hold on to this, and I'm trying, and I'm striving, and I'm working, and I'm doing it, and I'm doing it, and me, 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 and you're exhausted, and then you fall away, and then you come back, and then you fall away. You, all, you go through all this stuff. And what you need to see is God marks. You see here, do not harm them until we have sealed them. And in Matthew 16, it's really interesting because Jesus is with his disciples, and people start gossiping about Jesus. If they've been gossiped about, well, Jesus is, knows what that's like. So they're all talking about him. He's like, hey, who do people say that I am? They're like, oh, well, some people say you're this, some people say you're this. And he, Jesus is like, okay, okay. Hey, Simon Peter, who, who do you say that I am? And he says, you're the Christ. You're the Son of the living God. Like this beautiful confession. This is who you are. And then Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon. And then he says, not because, he said, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. Like you didn't figure this out on your own. This isn't human wisdom. He says, rather, my Father in heaven revealed this to you. God reveals to you your belief in him, and you act faith in what he has revealed to you. He marks you, he seals you, he calls you his own, he selects you, and you respond with, I trust you. I believe in you. I am yours. And seals in that time were also a sign of ownership. You don't touch that. That's not your seal. That's his seal. And the owner does what the owner desires with that thing that is sealed. So when God sends his judgments through his angel, the seal he has provided on his people means they will be able to stand through the judgments. They will be able to endure any and all tribulations, great and small. God's got you. One commentator says it this way. The sealing enables God's people to respond in faith to the trials through which they pass so that these trials become the very instruments by which they are strengthened in their faith. 
you know as well as I do, your faith is stronger because of your trials. When you're in the trial, you're, I don't like this at all. But when you look back on the trial, you realize that's what built my faith. That's what did it. You don't get your faith built by just looking at it. Like you don't build muscles by looking at a gym. I've tried it. It doesn't work. Just stare really hard. Nothing. It's through those trials. They are the actual tools in God's hand by which your faith is built and strengthened. You understand grace more. You understand mercy more. You understand his compassion more. Why? Because you've been through hell and back. This is the protective function of the seal. God sends the judgments on the earth, and here's what it does. It causes people who hate God to curse him all the more. The trial reveals you don't like this God. You think God owes you a good life. You think God owes you comfort. You think God owes you what you think. That's the evidence of a hard heart. So these judgments, they cause people who hate God to curse him all the more. It causes people who realize, I have no hope apart from God. I don't understand everything, but God, I need you. That's where many of us found God, right? It causes people who trust him to be strengthened by him, by this. So let me ask you the question, what are your trials doing to you? What is your trial right now? What is it revealing about your heart towards God? Are you angry at God? Questioning God? Are you mad because God's making your life harder than what you think it should be? I don't think God should use hard things. No, he does. Faithful hearts have eternity in mind, and we know this thing, God, hmm, seems really painful, but you always work things for good, and nothing separates me from your love for me, and so even though this really hurts, it's for good, and I live with the ultimate eternity in mind. That's what Revelation's screaming at you. Hey, stop looking at just today. Stop looking at just right now. Stop looking at just what you feel and recognize the big scope of everything. God's got me. I'm sealed. He uses all things for my good. And those who know this God who does this, that number is not just you. Man, it's a huge number. It's a massive number. From the Old Testament to the New, to people still who haven't even been born yet. John hears, verse 4, I heard the number. He's done a lot of seeing. Now he's doing a hearing. I heard the number of the sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel that Julie read so beautifully. Now this number, 144,000, what is that? Well, there's a lot of debate, of course. There's a lot of debate about everything in Revelation. But this number I don't think is literal. Now if you talk to Jehovah's Witnesses, or if you've known one, this number is very literal. Uh, there's only 144,000 people who will get to heaven. I think this is why if you ever see a Jehovah's Witness uh, hall or temple being built in your city, it will go up in about eight hours because they are working really hard to be in that number, 144,000. All the religions of the world tell you, you work hard, you get to be in the number. Mormonism tells you to work. Jehovah's Witnesses tell you to work. Quasi-religious people tell you. A lot of Catholics believe you have to work, work, work to get there. The gospel, though, is different. It's good news. It's not good advice. It's not get to work. It is good news. Somebody's done the work. You're in the number. You rejoice for being in the number. How'd you get in the number? He did all the work. Wow. That's what the gospel is that puts you in there. I remember pleading with a Jehovah's Witness one time. I was like, no, dude, no. I used to I mean, I'd see these guys have like bumper stickers, and I was in college. Like, I'm going to follow that guy and just ask him, and I would like... Some guy had some license plate that was written about something one time. I was like, I'm going to follow him to his house. I did. I tracked him all the way down. I live in the Midwest. People were, you know, nice and sweet, right? So it was only mildly creepy. And I'm like, hey, what does this your license plate mean? He's like, what do you, what do I? Oh, and then he starts telling me all this stuff. And I'm like, no, actually, that's, all, that's wrong. Actually, here's the gospel, you know? It's like, well, anyway, crazy times. Here's the deal. All right. Here's what I want you to know. God's protection for us is secured because of the blood of Jesus. 
This is, what we're t- this is what we're understanding. The protection of God is not our work, it's his work. In verse 4, John, here's the number of the 144,000. As the number of those are sealed, those are gods. And he lists these 12,000 from each tribe in the Old Testament. Now, in the Old Testament, you'd hear about the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 tribes and all these were the people as they were dispersed in the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom, you had tribes, so you had this way of um, marking, way of knowing and tracking and keeping track of and caring for God's people, shepherding God's people through these, these 12 tribes. You had kings leading these tribes, all this stuff. But um, So that's this Old Testament reference, but here's a couple interesting things. A lot could be said about this, but here's a couple things for you, which is when the 12 tribes are listed in the Old Testament, Judah's never mentioned first. And here, they're gonna, he hears from the tribe of Judah. Judah's listed first. Why is Judah first? Jesus, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Right from the very beginning, we're tying Old Testament to Jesus. And here's the other, another interesting point about this list. is Of this 12 tribes, the tribe of Dan is not listed. Now, when they would hear this, wait a minute, the 12 tribes, where's Dan? Why isn't Dan, Dan's been replaced with Manasseh? Why isn't Dan there? Well, Dan is uh, infamous. If you're famous for something good, you're famous. If you're famous for something bad, you're infamous, right? Well, you are now. So Dan is infamous for doing bad, that he led his people into idolatry. God had provided a place for them. God had provided a lot for them. And he didn't like that. They wanted something different. He didn't like what God was doing. He didn't trust in and obey what God had said. And so instead, what he starts doing is doing his own thing, going according to his own wisdom, leading his people eventually to idolatry and disobedience to God. Unfaithfulness to God. That is the very thing that John is writing the revel- this letter to, to people in the first century. You're enduring awful things from the Roman government. You're enduring awful things from the spiritual battle behind that, the enemy. Don't compromise. Don't compromise. Stay faithful. Hang in there. Hold on. See the lamb. Stay faithful. Dan, where's Dan? Dan was unfaithful. Dan's not there. There's a lot more you could say about that, a whole sermon about Dan. But don't give in to the false gods of this world found in pleasures, comforts, political power, self-made wisdom, your own understanding. So this 144,000 pulls in these tribes, this vision of the Old Testament people dating all the way back. They were sealed long ago. He hears this number. He recognizes Old Testament, all of these people and all the details within. Verse 9, but then I looked... And behold, a great multitude that no one could number. Wait a minute, we went from this specific number, and now we're getting into this multitude of of numbers from every nation, from all tribes, peoples, languages. And what are they doing? Standing before the throne. (laughs) Who can stand? Oh, there's people from all tribes, languages, nations. They're all standing. Some people interpret the 144,000 as pointing to Old Testament believers. And then the multitude is now, as the gospel has gone forward, and you have every, all the New Testament believers. That's an option. But some commentators think, as do I, that actually the 144,000 they would associate with that is then birthed into this, it's actually a multitude from every tribe and nation. Because in Revelation chapter 14, verse 3, the 144,000 are described as those who have been redeemed from the earth. Redeemed is a purchasing word. It's a buying word. It's what Jesus has done for his people that he has purchased us. He's paid your debt and mine. And all the saints of the Old Testament looked forward to a Messiah who would pay for their sins. And everybody since Jesus looks back on one who has paid for their sins. So collectively, old and new is this multitude of people who have this trust in Jesus. We have been redeemed, we've been sealed, we've been marked, we've been bought by, we are owned by him. We are his, we are not our own. And this truth moves from all of these 
promises and things that God was doing in the Old Testament birthing out to the nations of all people. So now you've got white guys from the Midwest in that number. You've got women from the Bahamas, children from Haiti, men and women who live in Homestead who have come from all over the place, South America, Central America, other parts of our country. We've got military families in this number who don't know where they're at, what year it is, <laughs> what's going on. Together we were sealed and protected because of the blood of Jesus. We are standing, verse 9 says. Who can stand? We can. We actually can stand. In verse 9 it says, they're standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes. Why are they white? Drop down to verse 14. These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. In the Old Testament, we were told, though your sins are like scarlet, red, they will be as white as snow. They are white because of Jesus. His blood was shed. He took the wrath and judgment you and I deserve. He, in a sense, was outside the ark as wrath poured down while we were inside, protected. We believe in him. We trust him. We have our allegiance to him. We're no longer stained. We're in white robes before his throne. As verse 10 says, saying, salvation belongs to our God. He has saved us. He has protected us from the enduring judgment we deserve. And he's held us up and he continues to hold us up when we can't hold ourselves up. This is what John sees. The number is too great to count. You got to be encouraged, lonely Christian. Those of us that are still isolated and, and separated and, and, and unable to gather together for a variety of reasons, you're not the only one. There is a multitude. One day we will see that multitude fully. And the way the enemy likes to work is to isolate and say, you're the only one. You're the only one going through this. You're the only one who deals with this. It's just you. You're the only one trying to hold on. Are you still holding on? That's ridiculous. And he isolates and mocks and narrows you down. And the scripture says, no, be encouraged. There's a multitude. You can't even count the number. And there will be a day you'll see it fully and be like, whoa. And everything you've endured, every temptation you fought against, everything you've learned and all of your failures and all of the victories God led you in, you'll see it with a multitude as we have story after story after story after story and testimony after testimony from generation upon generation upon generation, standing, telling stories of the glory of God and his work in our life. That day, that future is secure for you, Christian. I don't care what you feel like today or what you feel like. If you got a case of the Mondays tomorrow, if it's Tuesday and you still feel like it's the Mondays, this is secure for you because of Jesus. You've been marked. And here's what that protection of the lamb is aimed at. God's protection is aimed at increasing our enjoyment and worship of God himself. The protection that you have, the sealing, the marking, all of this in the, this in the Lamb is aimed to increase your enjoyment and worship of Him. This is what makes the prosperity gospel so vile and wicked. Because it says, if you do this for God, God will give you stuff. That's vile and wicked. In fact, that's what the enemy did to Jesus when he was tempting him. Hey, you do this, God will do this for you. He'll give you this thing. No, God gives you himself. God lets you see him. When you come through judgment, when you come through and realize, how are you standing here? Because <laughs> him, like, who is he? Wow. God is increasing your enjoyment of him. This is what's going on here. This is the future of what's happening here. <laughs> Anybody ever see the, the line, the witch in the wardrobe, the Chronicles of Narnia? Maybe you read the book back in the day, some of us, or saw the movies. And there's the, the Aslan, which is the lion, right? He's the, the Christ-like character in, in the story. Those of you are like, I haven't seen it. Well, I'm going to spoil it for you. So the lion, he fights for his people. At one point, he dies. But because he's like Christ, what happens? Resurrect. Hey. And there's a scene at the end where this 
this kid asked this girl about him who's been, she's been close to Aslan the lion. He says, is, is he safe? Is he safe? She's like, safe? No, <laughs> but he's good. He's good. He's, he's just, when you're around someone that's powerful, right? He's not safe and keeping you, like, you, you'll be fine. It's going to hurt. <laughs> But he's really good at everything he sends and does is always for your good. So is it safe and comfortable and easy? You can just sit in the corner and be fine. And No, man, it's going to be, whew, but it's good. And that's what he is leading his people through. And it's all aimed at you going, wow, wow. How do we get through that? Wow. You love a wow story, don't you? You want to be wowed. Part of our problem in America is we're bored. We play games and watch things on Netflix forever and ever. We just, we're bored. We want to be wowed. Millions and millions of people are turning to the Super Bowl tonight. Why? They want to be wowed. Wow us, Patrick Mahomes. Wow us. Wow us. Wow us. And he probably will. We're longing to be wowed. We're made for that. And what God has done to lead us through all the tribulations in our life Every trial, every pain you go through ultimately leads to an eternity of wow. Wow. You see this, verse 15. Therefore, they are before the throne of God. They have come through the tribulation. They have their white as can be, and they are before the throne of God, and they serve him day and night in his temple, and he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. You hunger no more, no thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them. No more South Florida heat. Scorching heat, same thing. Verse 17, for the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. He will guide them to springs of living water. Sounds like Psalm 23 a little bit, doesn't it? The Lord is my shepherd. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. What you see here is your sealed, secured, eternal intimacy with God. That what sin has broken, and though you feel so close to God, you also feel distant from God. You're his, and yet you also at times don't feel like it. There's still this, yes, but. It's true, but I still. Well, here, there's no more but. It's fully. Everything that is true will be fully experienced and realized. It sounds like the end of Revelation, doesn't it? Wiping away every tear from their eye. Like, did we just skip forward to the end of the book? Well, yes and no, because this is the end. <laughs> and it's going to happen again in Revelation. It's going to happen again in Revelation. It's going to happen again in Revelation. I told you it's not linear. This is called recapitulation. He's going to tell the same thing again and again and again. So we're at the end, and this is our secure future right there with him. But here's what you got to know and live in right now. The good news of that is not just cool, can't wait. It's live in that reality today. In the midst of everything that's going on, we live in this reality today so that you can enjoy God now. You don't have to wait for the pandemic to be over to worship God and enjoy him. You don't. It's not like, well, once this whole mask thing or once this vaccine or once, you know, another president or another president or whatever, once we, no, there is no once we, it's now. It's the enjoyment of God now in the midst of anything now. You can enjoy this reality now because if you're a Christian, here's the deal, you stand before the throne of God now. Did you know the scripture promises you, you can come boldly before the throne of grace to find mercy in your time of need? Why? Because you're awesome? No. I mean, you are, but because of what he did for you. You can come boldly before him. You have to run away. You run too. You stand before him and you are clothed with the righteousness of Jesus right now. You wear that. That's who you are in him. And we serve him day and night now. We are sheltered now amidst all the things of our life. We are sheltered with his presence. Are you aware of God's presence in your life? It doesn't mean the absence of trials or circum, you know, painful circumstances. It just means his reality with you 
right now. He shelters you. In Jesus, the hunger of your soul and the thirst of your soul is no more. Jesus would say, he's the bread of life. Come and feast on him. Are you thirsty? Come to him. He's unlike any other. This is our reality now. And he shepherds us. The springs of living water. He wipe, he's the wiper of our tears. He gets your pain. He gets your sorrows. Listen, we have much pain, much tribulation, much sorrow now. We do. And God understands that. And he is in the midst of that. And let me just land this plane right here. Is that the reality is this virus and this 2020, 2021, 2022, however long this whole season is going to go, it's impacted us in a variety of ways. Some of us have lost loved ones. Some of us are still praying that other ones will make it through because they're in the hospital. We've lost jobs. We've lost our way of living. We've lost a lot of things. And yet, what I have also seen in this is Christians who are able to say, all the more I long for Jesus. All the more I want his return. All the more he is my true hope. I grieve the things and the people that I've lost, but what it's also revealed is that I want him more. And that is beautiful. It has taken other people and they have grown angry. They're mad that they just don't have their life back. They've now used words and they've started to gossip about people. They've said things to me, about me, to you, about you. All this, we've all gone through that as this is what's happened. And yet at the same time, others have said, this world cannot contain my joy and my hope. It is all found in him. And when everything starts to break around me, it purifies and builds my faith all the more. That he is enough and he is worthy. I've seen people let this season divide them. They cancel out other Christians. They divide over things like politics and masks and all of this stuff. Brothers have said, I'm not going to let any temporary tribulation that we go through come between loving you and being your brother and your sister and understanding you, caring about you, serving you, giving to you. I'll do anything for your benefit. I've seen people do that. We've seen people continue to serve in our community continue to share their story and share their faith and reach out to others. No pandemic's going to impact that. No political season is going to impact that because it's about Christ and Christ alone. I've been marked by him. I'm sealed by him. I am his. I'm secure in him. He's protected me, and I enjoy him all the more, even through this tribulation. God, forgive us for living for temporary, momentary comforts and happiness. Let's live for him. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. God, thank you for your great mercy and grace. That though we get so caught up into momentary trials and tribulations, and they are momentary, they're real, they're painful, and yet they're momentary in light of eternity. And you don't waste a thing in our life. So forgive us for kicking against you. God, we want to join with heaven and say you're worthy. We want to walk in the reality, not of what other people have said we are, not of what our sins have defined us as, not as the things that the enemy accuses us and attacks us and fills our head with, but rather we want to walk in the reality of who we are, clothed in the righteousness of Jesus, received by you, loved by you, welcomed by you. What kind of God? To take sinners stained like us, make us white as snow, and receive us. Only you. Only you. Thank you for the gospel. Thank you for your work that you've done on our behalf. You are our hope. This world and the things of this world cannot contain our joy and our hope. They are but pointers. They are hints. We're thankful for parties and games, and we're thankful for music and gifts and all of these different things, and we know that ultimately, God, they're pointers to you, the great giver and the great gift of all things, and the one where our joy lies. We serve you alone, Lord. And all God's people said, amen. Church, we're going to close in 
song as we worship and join with heaven in proclaiming our hope in him. So I would encourage you, if you can, if you're here, if you're able to stand, to stand. We've also got communion available on the sides that you can take during the song or after as a way to say, I'm able to stand before God because of what the lamb has done. His body was broken, his blood was shed. You are forgiven, you are received by God. So let's take communion when you're ready. If you need prayer after the service, you can come over here with Monica. You can kneel down on the steps if you need to and pray. But let's seek the Lord and celebrate him in this time. So when you're ready, if you're able, stand.